thing. And so please bear with her and please bear with me um, as I move forward. So again, it's truly an honor uh, to be here uh, at Albany State University as a product of an HBCU, uh, the Florida a and uh, University. Uh, I know the value and the importance historically and even presently uh, of HBCUs. Uh, one of the most amazing aspects of writing this book, and this book was recently won the National Book Award, has been the response from the HBCU community. Uh, has been the response from people who went to HBCUs, has been the response from FAMU, uh, because it sort of shows what people who come from HBCUs are capable of, right? We are capable of competing with the best and beating the best, and we've done that for a very long time. Uh, and so again, it's, it's truly an honor. So before I begin my talk, I, I'd like to talk about uh, how I understand what it means to be intelligent. And, and the reason why I, I want to begin with that is because race and talking about race is one of the more difficult things for people to do in our society. And I think one of the reasons why it has been so difficult for people to talk about race is because in many ways, we're not necessarily taught how to be intelligent. And, and I'm not speaking about intelligent, intelligence as it relates to people knowing a lot. I don't define intelligence based on how much a person knows. I, def I define intelligence based on how much a person has a desire to know. So again, think about that differently. I don't think about intelligence based on how much a person knows. I think about intelligence based on how much a person has a desire to know, right? How much, of a, per how much a person has the, the desire to self-critique, to say that I am wrong, to be open to new ideas and changing their ideas. To me, that's the meaning of a person who is an intellectual, who is intelligent. And whether that person is here learning at Albany State or that person is down the road learning in a local prison. To me, that person, those same people are intelligent. That's how I understand who an intelligent person is. And those are the people who I want in my classrooms, right? People who truly want to learn, people who truly want to know, people who truly want to be challenged. And I say that because I'm probably going to challenge you a little bit <laughs> today in the way you think about race in America historically. And I would assume that most of you would think that this book, Stamped from the Beginning, which is a narrative history of racist ideas, was written for white people. And it certainly was, but it was also written for black people. It was written for black people because I think that if only black people read this book, and were transformed by some of the ideas in this book, I think that we would have a better nation. Now, before I get there, I, I want to sort of talk a little bit about a racist idea. Clearly, I wrote a history of racist ideas. And so just like any history, you have to first define what a racist idea is. And as many of you would probably imagine, Defining a racist idea is quite controversial. So as we know in our time, there are a bunch of people who are expressing what you would consider to be a racist idea, and none of these people consider their ideas to be racist. Every one of them says, oh, I'm not a racist. It doesn't matter what they say about black people, because this book is about anti-black racist ideas. It doesn't matter what they say about black people. At the end of the day, if we say, oh, that was racist, oh, no, I'm not racist. That idea was not racist. And what we should know is that that is not a new phenomenon. Slaveholders would say all types of things about black people and then turn around and say their ideas were not prejudiced. That was sort of the way we understood it then. They would say, no, our, these ideas that I'm stating that black people are cursed forever into slavery, 
or blackness is a mark of enslavement, so you should be enslaved, or that the history of African barbarism nurtured black people into being nicely fit for slavery, they would say, oh no, these ideas aren't prejudice. These ideas are God's law. These ideas are nature's law. These ideas are common sense, right? And so, you know, I chronicled the history of racist idea and I've yet to come across a single person in American history who is willing to admit that their ideas were racist. I've yet to come across a single person, not slaveholders, not slave traders, not segregationists, not the police officers who are killing black people in the street. Right now, none of these people, no one. And so again, I, I think you can imagine that's why it's so controversial to simply define what a racist idea is. And what you should also know is every group of racists have defined their ideas outside of racism. In other words, they created definitions for racism that did not include their ideas <laughs> because they did not want to be considered racist. You see the way that sort of works, right? And so they said, those people down the street are the racist ones, not me. All right, and so just like people now are calling Black Lives Matter activists the real racist, so too were slaveholders saying the abolitionists were the real racist. Right? You see the way that sort of works. And so I ended up defining a racist idea in a very simple way as any idea that suggests that a racial group is superior or inferior to another racial group in any way. Any idea that suggests a racial group is superior or inferior to another racial group in any way. And so any sort of racial hierarchy, any sort of idea that puts one racial group above or below another is a racist idea. It's a very simple idea. But what makes it complex is the term racial group. And so when I say racial group, I'm not just referring to black people in general, or let's say white people in general. Each and every person in this room who identifies as black doesn't just have a racial identity, they also have a gender identity. They have a class identity. They have a sexual identity. They even have a professional identity. There are black professors in this room. There are black students in this room, right? They even have an ethnic identity, right? And so black people as a race are a collection of racial groups. Black men are a racial group that is distinct from black women. The black poor are a racial group. Black elites are a racial group. Black heterosexuals are a racial group. Black professors are a racial group, right? Black students are a racial group. So again, going back to that def definition, any idea that suggests a racial group is inferior or superior to another racial group in any way is a racist idea. Now, in our time, we don't say this racial group is inferior or superior. What we do in our time is we say, this is what's wrong with black women. And then we reel off all of these things that are wrong with black women as a group. Now, again, I'm talking about groups. That's why I keep saying racial group. When, 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 when you say that something is wrong with a racial group, that's different than saying this, there's something wrong with that one individual. Those are two different things, right? But one of the things that we've been taught to do by racist ideas is to generalize individual black negativities. In other words, we see, I date a black woman, and that black woman acts a particular way, and then I say, black women are like this, right? We generalize the individual negativity. While, let's say if I dated a white woman, and that white woman acted a particular way, I would say that white woman <laughs> acted a particular way. Right? And so we end up generalizing these groups. And so when I sort of started conceiving of this definition, and I understood that it wasn't just black people in general that racist ideas have targeted, but each and every one of these black groups have been targeted with racist ideas, 
I came to realize that over the course of my lifetime, I had consumed and expressed racist ideas about black people, about black groups. I had consumed and expressed racist ideas about black women, about the black poor. I had stated that there were certain things wrong with these groups. And so be, even before I could study and chronicle the history of racist ideas that anyone else in America had stated, I first had to interrogate my own, right? And so, of course, that was quite difficult. You know, I, it didn't really get no blacker than me. You know, I grew up in, a, in, in an all-black town. My parents came out of the Black Power Movement. You know, I got three degrees in African-American studies. I went to an HBCU, right? So I, I grew up in a progressive, egalitarian, black community my whole life. And, and so for me, that was quite jarring to think that I, too, had consumed racist ideas. And so I say that to say that's why this book is not just for white readers. This book is also for black readers. And so one of the things that I hope happens as black people read this book is that they challenge their own ideas in that every time we have stated that there's something wrong with this group or that group, we would first recognize it as a racist idea and then question, where's the evidence for that? Right, and, 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 and I want to sort of go into one major idea that probably many of us have. And then I'll sort of give some concluding remarks. And then I'll hopefully facilitate a conversation. I think the most widespread idea that black people have about black people, and this idea is simultaneously the most dangerous racist idea that black people have about black people, and let me just say that pretty much everyone has this idea about black people, is the idea that black neighborhoods are dangerous and that black people are more dangerous than white people. Anybody heard that idea? Anybody been walking down the street at night and seen that young brother and was like, hmm, I'm a little scared, right? And that ever happened to anybody? And, and, and so this idea, which is an idea I even had, is based on a number of different factors. The first factor, because any, every single, I should say, you know, in the book, I chronicle not, not just racist ideas, but all of the so-called evidence that people put forth to justify those ideas. So people don't just don't say black neighborhoods are dangerous. They also make a case for why black neighborhoods are more dangerous than white neighborhoods. They make a case for this dialectic between the safe white neighborhood and the unsafe black neighborhood. And one of the main things they say is, look at crime statistics. They say that, and they've been saying it since roughly 1890, that more crimes happen in black neighborhoods. Now, what we should know is that crime statistics is based on two sets of statistics, arrest and incarceration rates. So there are more people being arrested and incarcerated in black communities. So then what people say is that means black people are committing more crimes. I'll let you sit with that for a second, because I'm sure you know where I'm going with, with that. Right, so we, when people think, criminologists, police officers, everyday people think that arrest rates are reflective of actual crime rates. So in other words, every time I, apparently we commit a crime, we get arrested. I didn't know that, because I committed crimes and I got arrested. <laughs> and I'm sure you have too. So then how is it that why is it that there are greater numbers of people being arrested and thereby incarcerated in black neighborhoods? Maybe there are more police officers in black neighborhoods. When you have more police officers, you have more people being arrested. And when you have more people being arrested, you have more people being incarcerated. Well, we should, we should also know that the majority of people who are incarcerated today are incarcerated for nonviolent drug-related offenses. Did y'all know that? 
the majority of people who are in prison today, they're not in there for rape or murder. They're in there for nonviolent drug-related offenses. In other words, I'm walking down the street in my community, and all of a sudden I get stopped in frisk, which for a while was legal, and they find marijuana or crack on me, and now I'm off to jail. And for some people, it's my third strike, so I'm in there for the rest of my life. Right? And so we should also know that 40% of the incarcerated population in this country right now is black, even though black people represent about 13% of the overall population. So we are overrepresented in the incarcerated population. So what that would then mean is we must be three times more likely to sell and consume drugs than white people. Well, no, actually, that's not the case. When people do studies, they find that the racial groups sell and consume drugs at similar rates. So, you know, all of these videos, or I'm sorry, all these shows in which you see these white people going into the hood to buy drugs, yeah, that's TV. <laughs> that's not reality. Most white people buy drugs from other white people. Just like most black people buy drugs from other black people, right? You have just as many drug sellers who are white as black. But we also know that black people sometimes 10, 20 times more likely to be arrested when they're selling drugs, arrested when they're possessing drugs, which then leads to this disparity. But of course, the policing community is not going to say, you know what, we're at fault because we're focusing, we're arresting these people at higher numbers due to our racist ideas, due to our racist policies. No, they'll say no. They're being arrested more because they commit more crimes. It's in their interest to state that. Another thing we should know about this whole conception of the dangerous black neighborhood where all of these black people commit crimes is it's primarily based on homicide rates. Right? So we're told that black people commit more homicides. There's more violent crime in black communities. And that's why we think that black communities are more dangerous. Right? Now people are like, okay, I understand that drug stuff. Now how are you going to prove to me <laughs> that, that, that that's not the case? Well, actually, studies show that there's a direct correlation between violent crime and unemployment rates. Direct correlation across racial groups. Across racial groups, you have a higher level of unemployment, you have a higher level of violent crime, whether it's whites, blacks, Latinos, Asians, anyone. And so we also know that black people over the last 50 years, as, as my brother stated in, 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 in the introduction, have their unemployment rate is twice as high as the white unemployment rate. We know that in some communities, in black communities, the unemployment rate is 60%. And in the nearby white community, it's 5%, right? We know the dis mass disparities between unemployment rates. We also know from that statistic that there's a direct correlation between unemployment rates and violent crime, that there really is no such thing as a violent black neighborhood, but there is a such thing as a violent unemployed neighborhood. You see the way that sort of, that's what an intellectual would say. You know, if there's, a, there's no correlation between blackness and violent crime, which there is not, which is why you have a black community with lower levels of unemployment, you have lower levels of violent crime, right? You have a black community with higher levels of unemployment, you have higher levels of violent crime. So there's no correlation between black people and violent crime, black communities and violent crime, but there is a correlation between unemployment and violent crime. What an intellectual will say is, there's a such thing as an unemployed violent neighborhood. And so then the next step would be, you know what? If we want to reduce violent crime, what would we do? Reduce unemployment, right? Instead of saying, you know what? You know, black people, they're just so immoral. You know, because again, if we, if we paint violence as blackness, if we connect violence to a group of people, then the next step is to say we somehow have to civilize these people away from their criminal and violent behavior. Because apparently that's what's causing the violence. 
if we're taught that it's black people who are causing the violence. That's why we spent so much time trying to put cops on the street to reduce crime and simultaneously bring all of these programs into these communities to civilize these people to, so they'll stop committing crimes. When in fact the real solution is reducing unemployment. We should also know that more people every year die violently from drunk drivers than they do from homicides. And studies show, one study found that 75% of drunk drivers are white men. But when people think of violent crime, they don't even think of drunk drivers. That's not even in their conceptual radar. But if we were to integrate drunk driving and drunk drivers into our conceptual radar, it would expand our notion of what is a dangerous neighborhood. Right, in, in those communities that have a l more people who are drinking and driving and killing people would be considered more dangerous. But because drunk drivers are typically white men and because our racist ideas com compel us to say white men are not dangerous but black men are and black women are, people can't even conceive of a white neighborhood with white people being dangerous even though year after year, more people die in those neighborhoods from drunk driving than people in black neighborhoods from homicides, right? I mean, people can't even conceive of that because it's our racist ideas preventing us from doing that. And so for me, I didn't know all of this before I entered into research for this book. I didn't know all of this. Uh, and so I came to realize that the idea that black neighborhoods are more dangerous is not based on reality. It's based on racist ideas. And that there are dangers in neighborhoods that people who identify as black are in, but it's not the result of the people. It's the result of the policies. And if what's really the connection between danger is unemployment. I should also state very briefly, since I'm on someone on a roll, <laughs> uh, that, and this is what becomes really jarring, is that a study out, out of Seattle that studied the drug, that studied drug violence in Seattle found that the police may be increasing the violence in black communities, not reducing it. People are like, how could the police? Well, actually, the way it works is this, according to this study. The mass incarceration of drug dealers in Seattle, according to these researchers, led to people constantly fighting for control of drug markets. And their constant fight over control of drug markets created what? Violence for control of those drug markets. In other words, if I'm controlling a block, right, and, and then I get arrested, and now there is a, what, opening for the two people on the nearby blocks to control my blocks. And so they're going to fight, usually violently, for control of my block. While in another community, in the suburbs of Seattle, where there's not a mass incarceration of the drug dealers, the people who are controlling those blocks are able to maintain control of those blocks and reinforce control. Right, and so there's not as much fighting over drug markets. Right, and so, you know, these researchers found that, you know what, it seems as if the police even know that when they arrest a drug dealer, it's gonna increase violence. But they continue to do it because there's a number of different mechanisms that basically it's in their self-interest to continue to arrest people. Uh, and, and so that's just another sort of tidbit. So it's a lot more complicated than simply saying there's something wrong with black people. There's something wrong with black on black crime. And black people need to just get themselves together um, when we talk about the dangers and even the crimes in black neighborhoods. And, and I should say that really every idea that we've been taught or that we've expressed about black people, I could probably sit here and prove to you why that idea is actually not true. 
But what happens is anti-racist ideas that suggest that there's nothing wrong with black people, that suggest that the racial groups are equal, are typically very complex. And it's very complex to, to teach and to understand anti-racist ideas. While it's quite easy to say, you know what, this 40% incarcerated population is black, it must be because black people are committing more crimes. It's a very easy and logical explanation, right? Racist ideas are, and historically they have been, which is why people easily digest them and people easily reject anti-racist ideas as crazy and, and illogical and it doesn't make sense. And so, you know, I've studied the history of racist ideas about black people. And I've studied many different ways in which people have tried to prove and suggest that there was something wrong or inferior about black people. And I've yet to come across a single theory that is actually true, that cannot be proven itself to be wrong. And so all of these theories that suggest that there's something wrong with black people are simply not true. And, and again, I should say that I'm talking about black people as a group. You know, I'm not saying that there aren't black people who are dangerous. There are not black people who commit crimes. There are not black people who are lazy. There are not black people who are all of these negative traits. There are individuals but there are no more lazy black people than there are lazy white people. We just think that they are, even though we don't have any evidence for it, right? There's no more anything. And so I wanted to end with, with an idea. And, and, and that is that the only thing that is wrong with black people is that we think something is wrong with black people. Thank you. Questions, comments? Oh, yes. really, uh, thank you so much for being here and congratulations on your award. Um, one of the points that you make in your book, uh, you talk about how um, racist policies actually uh, dictated the racist ideas. And um, if you look at the current election uh, this year, many of, much of the rhetoric used by the Trump uh, campaign was really to um, incense people who would embrace those ideas and would support him. But history suggests that those policies very seldom help the average citizen, the average voter. Many of them vote against their interests, even though they believe that this would promote their interests. Even though it's hard to get Congress to pass laws these days, we can repeal the law or we can uh, pass a new law but getting rid of some of those racist ideas and helping people to understand that that is not in their best interest is really hard. Can you give us some strategies that we might be able to use to help people to see beyond the racist ideas and understand that those policies really don't promote their best interest? Generally, it promotes the elite the wealthy and those who own property. Even slavery did not promote the interests of poor whites. It promoted the, the interests of those who owned slaves. And that was a very small percentage of the southern population. So how do we address those particular policies and get people to understand that the racist ideas that they hold very true really are not and that they don't promote their best interests? Well, thank you for that question. Uh, it allows me to, to speak more to the underlying thesis of the book, which of course I didn't speak about today. And, and that is that we've been taught this history and this line of thinking that ignorance and hate is what causes people to express racist ideas. In other words, when somebody says something racist, we're like, oh, they're so ignorant and hateful. That is why they are stating that. And then we've been taught 
that it's people who have these racist ideas are the people who then create racist policies, like slavery, segregation, and even today, mass incarceration. So ignorance and hate leads to racist ideas, which leads to racist policies. So I found through studying the motives behind the producers of racist ideas, which are dis different from the consumers. So Donald Trump is a producer of racist ideas. Donald Trump's voters are consumers of racist ideas. So I studied the Donald Trumps historically. And I investigated, OK, why were they producing and circulating and defending these racist ideas? Were they ignorant and hateful? And I found Imani's like, no, it wasn't that. <laughs> uh, and, you know, and I found over and over again, again, studying these major producers, that they were not ignorant and hateful. Quite the contrary. They were producing these racist ideas to justify existing racist policies. And these existing racist policies were in their interest, were typically in their self-interest. So in other words, I found that it was the opposite. It wasn't ignorance leading to racist ideas, leading to racist policies. It was racist policies leading to racist ideas, which leads to ignorance and hate. In other words, as a slave owner, I want to make money. I start enslaving black people. I want to continue enslaving black people. I defend or circulate racist ideas that these people should be enslaved. And then the people consume these ideas become ignorant and hateful. Right? And so you know, to the question, what that means is that for the producers of racist ideas, we cannot educate them away from their racist ideas. We cannot embrace them with love and think that they're going to stop expressing those racist ideas. If we want to get rid of or stop the production of racist ideas, we have to eliminate racist policies. The focus should be on eliminating racist policies. But the consumers of racist ideas are a little bit different. And I think, I think, I think you were asking more so about the consumers. Now, consumers of racist ideas can be persuaded and educated away. However, what racist ideas have done historically has been to nurture what I call in the book unintelligent self-interest. Unintelligent self-interest. And so, you know, people have been led to believe that the problem in their communities is black people, immigrants, Muslims, all of these different people, as opposed to the real people who are actually limiting their socioeconomic rights. Right? And so why? Because those people who are limiting those socioeconomic rise want to continue doing so. Right? And so how do they do that? By directing those people's ire away from them and onto these people. Right? And we should know that they're doing that strategically. Right? You know, I, throughout the Trump, throughout the election, I always wondered whether Trump even believe some of the things that was coming out of his mouth. Like so, because he, I know he recognized the power that these things had on the minds of the people. Uh, but I didn't know whether he actually believed it. He's a marketer. He's a mass marketer. He's a brilliant marketer of himself, of his brand. And I didn't know whether he was simply marketing or whether he actually believed these things. And it really doesn't matter. <laughs> but. So yeah, so I think we should focus, we can educate, we have to basically show Trump voters what's in their self-interest. We do. I mean, that's our job to educate and persuade them, but we have to distinguish them from the powerful people and, and recognize that the powerful producers will not, cannot be educated or persuaded away. And so how do you do that? How do you persuade somebody? and educate somebody that it's in their self-interest. One of the things that I'm going to do for people that I know who voted for Trump is I'm going to say that, you know what? You know what's going to happen? Trump, after four years, and you're poor, is going to tell you that you're poor because of black people, because of immigrants, right? Because of all of these groups. I bet you that's what's going to happen. Right, when really it's his policy. So you can't turn around and blame Obama's policies for you being poor and then turn around and say, oh, well, Trump, 
I'm, I'm going to give Trump. So just give Trump the same, just give him the same responsibility as you did Obama. Will you be willing to do that? Right? And we'll see what they do, right? Other questions, comments? <laughs> yes. different ideas that people have created to demean the black poor. That typically black elites have created or uh, recreated about all of the things that were wrong with the black poor. And, and one of the things that I'm hoping people realize is that all of these ideas are not true. And, and, and I'm also hoping, and I was going to talk a little bit more about this tonight. There's a reception, um, and I'll be speaking about stamped again tonight, we'll talk a little bit about that afterwards. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit more uh, about the fact that what middle income black people do not realize is that the higher you get in the socioeconomic ladder, the more racism you are going to experience. Studies show, the higher you get, and so what Middle income black people think is, is actually quite the opposite. You know, the more I strive, the more I've lit myself, the more white people will be like, you know what, you're actually not bad. I don't have to basically, it. no, actually, it's quite the opposite, right? And, and, and so the racism, there is, in, there's, it's in the intelligent self-interest of middle income black people to eliminate racism that's affecting them and the black poor because it is slowing their own socioeconomic rise, right? And so even though we try to sort of leave and sort of dodge the whole discussion of racism, no, actually, you're in a very you know, good situation, but without racism, you would be even a better situation. And that's sort of the way historically it's worked. But you know, it's hard for us to understand that, right? You, you know, if you're in a good job, you just think that you're in a good job because you worked hard, and chances are you are. But I guess what I'm trying to say is chances are without racism, you would be in an even better job. But I don't think people even recognize that. And they blame poor blacks for racism as opposed to the real progenitors of racism, which is white people who are trying to specifically keep you down because they don't want black people to bust through and be in things like the White House. <laughs> yes. Um. conversation, talking about us being very self-reflective and us having the capacity to self-critique, is that there are some black people who go to a Harvard 
and think of themselves as superior to the black people that they left behind. And so thereby, those black people are like, you're different because you're acting different. Now, I'm not saying that that is your brother. I don't know. I would have to basically study his ways and his ideas. No, no, no. Listen, do you, do you hear what I'm saying? So there are black, do you, do you think that there are some black people who would go to a Harvard and is like, I am not like those black people anymore? Do you think there are any black people who are like that? Okay, so what I'm saying is there are some black people who themselves separate in their own minds from the community that they left behind, and then that community recognizes that, and so then that community withdraws. And so again, I don't know whether your brother does that, and, but I do know that every single, most black people who do that would refuse to admit that they're doing that, right? And so I don't really know. Uh, but I, sh I do know that there are black people who think of themselves and think of black people more broadly as not capable of a Harvard. And so then when a, somebody goes to a Harvard and succeeds like your brother did, in their mind, they're like, that person is not really black. And so then they distance themselves. So what I'm saying is both, both things are a function of racist ideas. And I don't know whether it's your brother distancing himself from those people or those people distancing themselves from him. Either way, it's based on racist ideas. And so again, I would, I would ask you to ask him whether he thinks of himself as any different since he came to Harvard, since he graduated from Harvard. Does he understand himself as an extraordinary black person? Because that's really the real question. Um, I should also state that one of the things that I chronicle in the book is what I call the extraordinary Negro. Uh, and this conception emerged very early, the extraordinary Negro. And the, what the extraordinary Negro is, is essentially, when you have black people who are defying stereotypes and defying what white people say we are, you know, black people can't speak, they can't do all of these things, what white people do what some white people do, because I, I don't want you to think that I'm saying all oh, when I say white people, um, is they look at that person as extraordinary. We've seen that with, with Obama. Obama is an extraordinary black person. But what that also means is he's not like those ordinarily inferior black men. Right? He's extraordinary. And so again, that's one of the reasons why some whites are able to embrace these extraordinary <laughs> Negroes because in their minds they're not really black and some of these extraordinary Negroes understand themselves as extraordinary and thereby not really like those ordinary inferior black people and so one of the reasons why um, I love Tadika to give an example who went to Spelman the beautiful I mean the, the, one of the top of course the top second to FAMU uh, HBCUs in the country you know, then she went to Yale Med, one of the top med schools in the country. Then she ultimately studied at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, one of the top, the top, I should say, children's hospital in the world. But you would never know that from speaking to her. She does not understand herself as in any ways extraordinary, as this extraordinary sort of person. I think that's from her upbringing. I think that's from this Albany community. Uh, she's clearly rooted. Um, and those are the types of people that we need. No matter how high you rise in this so-called ladder, you still understand yourself at the bottom with everybody else. Other questions, comments? Yes. So as a society, as an African American society, society in the election, how do we get, as black people, how do we get each other to understand what's going on with, you know, the issues of racism. How do we come together as a whole? So, yeah, I, I, you know, we, we talk a lot of things about black people. We talk a lot, as black people, about what's in the black community and trying to sort of bring people together. And I would argue that really the only thing that's separating black people is racist ideas. That's it. Is racist ideas. And, you know, if we were really to, were to think about it, uh, and, and I should also state that black people are more unified politically than any other racial group. 
There's a reason why you look at all of the racial groups and who they voted for this election and the previous election and the election before that, that more black people voted for a single candidate than any other racial group. And it's been like that for a very long time. And so we shouldn't have a sense that black people have a unity problem. We don't have a unity problem if we're comparing it to other racial groups. But we do have a problem with racist ideas. And the way that problem works out is very simple. What racist ideas teaches us or tells us is that if there are racial disparities, if there's a poor black community, black people are to blame for that. And all of the things that are wrong with black people are to blame for that. That's what racist ideas teach us to do. And that's what black people who have consumed racist ideas think. That what's wrong, the reason why you have black people being twice as likely to be unemployed as white people is because black people are lazy, black people don't want to work, black people don't want to get a job, black people are unqualified, all of these ideas which then prevent those black people from recognizing that job discrimination and racist policies in the job market that we can see and not see are the real cause of that disparity, right? And so then we are focused on putting down black people as opposed to putting our efforts at challenging these policies, of uncovering these policies. And so I, I would say to your question that we as individuals need to come to recognize that to truly be an anti-racist, to truly be an anti-racist is to, when we see racial disparities, we see not what's wrong with black people, what we see racial discrimination. And we, we are committed to challenging racial discrimination. And we simultaneously recognize that there is nothing wrong with black people as a group. Yes. So you could say that this election is, is a bit like a lot of the young people online are saying, or those that's marching, uh, when things fall apart, they're actually falling into place. So we can use this opportunity, and this is how they, you know, I've talked to a couple, this is how they think that things are falling apart, actually falling into place, so, or the roof is on fire, let it burn, and then pick up pieces. However, I don't have that fear about when the election changed to where it is now. I just see that when we have opposition, that's our chance for opportunity. So how can we turn these one trillion dollars that the Pew research uh, came two years ahead of their research to say that black people here in America is worth over one trillion dollars, that we have money, but we have little power. How can we turn that in our communities to help those that do teach a value system in their household, and a lot of times they don't understand that they're poor until they graduate from college. A lot of them, you know, until they graduate from high school, until they leave home. Because a lot of values are taught in homes, and you can see it in the communities, that they have a great good value system, except that when they get from high school and go to college, then this society is saying, oh, our household was, was, was property like I grew up in a household like that. Nine kids. I'm the oldest. But there was no returning uh, juvenile delinquent and uh, teenage pregnancy. But society said our household was at the property line. But you would never know it by the value system that was taught. So to me, what you're saying is what is the research Which means that. When it comes to values and what most humans would consider to be good values, there is not, it is not the case that poor families are less likely to teach those good values than rich families. There's no correlation between the poorer you are, the less likely you're able to teach good values. There's none of that. We're just taught and we came to believe that poor black people teach poor values. And the way we do that is because we come across poor black individuals or individual black families, and those individual black families are acting stereotypically or negatively. And then we generalize that family to say that's how poor black people act. Without, and we don't generalize your family, right? When we come across her family, we're like, oh, well, they're extraordinary, <laughs> right? They're not ordinary. When in fact, that family is ordinary, studies show. I should also state, in terms of 
the one trillion dollar amount of money that black people have is, you know, there's a lot of discussion, of course, in black communities that black people should value black businesses, black schools, black churches, black universities. But one of the reasons why we don't is because of racist ideas, right? We have a bad experience at a black business and we're like, you know, these black businesses can't get it together. Generalization, right? Now all black businesses in Albany apparently has to suffer because of that one black business. Even though when we go to a white business, first of all, we don't understand it as a white business, but we enter into that white business, we have a bad experience, and we're like, I will never go to that business again, as opposed to all black businesses. The same thing with HBCUs, right? I went to FAMU, I know that what happens? You have a bad experience at an HBCU, what do people say? Well, that's how HBCUs are. Now, all of a sudden, all 150 HBCUs have to, have to basically deal with what that one financial aid officer, because it's usually financial aid, right? <laughs> uh, with that one, the way that one financial aid person acted, right? Or even Albany State in general, right? While at a white institution, we would say, yeah, that financial aid officer was extremely rude to me. That's it, individualized, right? And so now we're like, I don't know whether I want to send my kid to an HBCU. I don't know whether my brother should go to an HBCU. So then, you know, and, and so it sort of recycles. And those are racist ideas. Those are generalizations based on anecdotes, personal anecdotes. That's not an intellectual sort of thing to do, but we regularly do that. And I say we because I've done it too. Yes. Maybe this is just a, a semantic uh, question, but um, how would you respond for your definition of racist ideas to the uh, folks who would, uh, would argue that, that racism or racist ideas have to conform to an existing power structure, meaning, of course, that uh, you know, white people can be racist or, or create racist ideas or be the creators or um, audiences of racist ideas against African Americans, for instance, or Latinos or uh, Asians, but that um, you know, black people can't be racist or the creators of racist ideas against white people. So, so I don't, my book is not about racist ideas that black people may have about white people. Um, my, book, my book is about racist, racist ideas that black people may have about black people. Uh, and, and I should also state that in the late 60s, you had the emergence of the black power movement. Some of the people in this room were in this movement, not to date them. Um, and during this movement, these black people who were saying things like black is beautiful, who were saying things we should value Albany State, who were saying things like we should value black businesses, were called racist. In the same ways that people in the Black Lives Matter movement today are called racist. In the same way that Barack Obama, when he says, yes, there's police brutality, is called racist, right? And so then what happened in reaction to that was you had progressives who said that Black people cannot be racist because black people don't have power. And really, this was a definition that had to do with black on white, I guess we can say, racism. It really did not have to do with black, presumably on black, racism. But one of the reasons why that theory is problematic is first, it was largely reactionary. In other words, y'all know what I mean by reactionary. Basically. It was in the moment. In other words, people did not sit back and reflect and decide on a definition of racism. They were responding to them being called racist and were like, okay, you know what, how do we defend against that? Okay, let's create this notion that black people can't be racist because black people don't have power. What was ironic about that is the very people who were calling for black power and ultimately seized black power, and we see black power all across the nation, were the very people saying black people don't have power. And so thereby black people can't be racist, which really, to me, never really made much sense. So black people do have power. Like I, as a professor, a black student comes in my room, I can be like, I don't think black students are smart, so I'm gonna fail that student. That's a function of my power based on racist ideas. Right? And so black people have power. Now, they don't have nearly as much power as white people, just like they don't have nearly as much wealth as white people. But to say that black people don't have power is just not in touch with reality and to me is not, is not 
recognizing the ways in which all of these struggles over the last 50 years has garnered black people power. Um, and then I would also state very briefly that what white supremacists have done with this definition is they have put black people who have the same racist ideas and who are willing to ex execute the same racist policies in positions of power to replace the white people. And then progressives are like, how do I challenge this person? They're black, so I can't call them racist. <laughs> and these white supremacists know that. And they know that if you put a black person in a position of power who's going to execute your racist policies, it creates a conundrum for activists because they don't want to call black people racist. Yeah, these people are thinking overtime, and we need to think overtime too. Other questions, comments? Sure. How is that possible? Power comes in control, as we see. So, if you don't have any control, how in the world do we have power? So, I think we should understand power in a relative sense. So, you know, we can't understand power in an absolute sense. And so, in other words, if you understand it in a political sense, there's a mayor, and a mayor has power. Does that mayor have as much power as the governor? No, the governor has more power. Does the governor have as much power as the president? No, but the governor does have power. And so we should understand there's really a, a, a sort of a scale of power and black people have power within that scale. And black people have power over their children. Black people have power over their institutions that they control. Uh, black people have power in a city like Albany, where there's 60% of the population, or at least they should have power, right? And so there are, there are ways in which black people have power. So you can have power in Albany, but clearly not have power in the state, right? Because black people are not a majority in the state. And I think it's very dismissive of black people to not recognize the power that we have, because we've been fighting in this country for centuries for power. And so ultimately to say we don't have any power is really dismissive of all of the struggles that we have won. Now we have not won power to completely control our destiny in this nation, but we have won power to control parts of our destiny. And so that really is the ultimate struggle for black people to have complete control over their destiny, but we have some control. And that some control is some power is there is this conception that black people um, should be responsible for uplifting black people. So, but what we don't recognize is why isn't that, why don't white people have that same conception about white people? In other words, why do we hold, why do we say that each and every wealthy black person should use their money to uplift the black community and if they don't, they're a problem, but we don't hold white people or those rich white people to the same standard. It's another way for us to critique and, and basically that's one, of the, that's one of the prevailing ways in which people have critiqued black elites, to say that black elites are inferior to white elites. You have all this money, you're just wasting it, and therefore black people are just writhing in poverty, and so that's what's wrong with black elites. But what people don't recognize is that there are many white people who blow $30,000 while millions of white people are poor and they don't care about those white people. But those people are not critiqued in the same way. And, and I just think that if we're going to critique people, we should critique elites. In other words, people who have money do not use that money to help people who are poor. That's not making a racial argument. That's saying that there are a bunch of people in this country with a lot of money who are not using their money to help the poor. And those people are black, Latino, Asian, white, they're all racist. Yes. I have one last question. I have one more question. Sure. So, um, what do you think about politicizing in every environment, like Colin Kaepernick uh, using his platform to do what he did? Um, I think I work a government job, I can't politicize, you know, and that, but like you said, I think policies 
affect everything. What do you think about politicizing in every environment? Like whatever platform you have to do that with. So again, we, we I've talked a lot, I've talked about the way to undermine racist ideas is to focus on racist policies. And so the two ways we eliminate racist policies is by protesting racist policies or by getting in positions of power that allow you to shape policy. And so, you know, a person can literally be, their individual goal is to get into a position of power so that they can shape policy. That is a very activist thing to do. And if anyways, that's even more activist than the person who is challenging racist power because that person is in power <laughs> and they're able to shape the so you know even in your government job right you may have control over policies or may have the ability to change policies in a very quiet deliberate way and that may have a profound effect on the lives of black people and I like i have yet to find a study that shows that white people are better at promoting their interests than black people do even though we like to think that white people have quote, more because they've advanced their interests more. Well, actually, I don't know that. Um, and so, you know, we should recognize, again, that the only thing that's wrong with black people is that we think something is wrong with black people. We think something's wrong with black elites. We think something's wrong with the black poor. We think something is wrong with black politicians. And I'm just waiting for the study to prove this. Yes. So you can say in the next 20, maybe 30 years that um, when we have a dialogue with my buddies, they think, you know, we need to get with just us, just us. So I'm the person in the middle, and I'm saying, no, uh, it won't be just us, because my grandkids and great-grandkids would thank all of us. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's a movement moving toward that includes all of us, not just black, not just white, not just gray, but people as a whole? And that when you empower people within, regardless of what, um, economically um, status they are, that things go much better. Now, it, it hasn't even been 100 years. It hasn't even been over 65 years since we had the civil rights uh, signed the paper with the new social programs that came about, which I think uh, did more damage in a lot of ways than homes when we allow than anything. So teaching in the community about empowering those households that uh, may have problems, or uh, people being brave enough to take back their neighborhoods when there are drugs and other things that's going on that's undesirable. Those are uh, some of the things that grassroots that we can move toward. Uh, when we change the idea about snitching, you know, uh, various things as a way of keeping the neighborhood, uh, uh, that, you know, those that are paying taxes to a home they own, but they can't leave their home because they're afraid of being broken into. Those are the grassroots things that we do. When we start um, without even getting a 501c grant, uh, taking young people, uh, mentoring, without worrying about uh, is I'm going to get paid for it. Those are grassroots things that we do. Those are things that I've seen here in Albany also. So, to some people, well, we, we, we've been doing this for a long time. No, we are not. We are not helpless. I do not see myself as helpless. Um, I think that here in America, that the poorest, the homeless person on the streets has it better than people in third foreign country. So that says a lot. That also gives hope that no matter what the election brought about us, this is an opportunity, even though it looks like opposition, mm -hmm. to bring something great out of it. Well, I, I would say that you asked whether I think there's a movement afoot. And, and I would say yes, because of people like you. And, and I think other people who are willing to challenge the problems in the, their communities. But I, what I'm hoping that, that comes out of that movement is for people to not see what is wrong with these black people and for people to see what's wrong with unemployment levels, for people to see what's wrong with homelessness levels, for people to see what's wrong with mass incarceration levels, and for people to focus their efforts on eliminating that. I'll also state that clearly I've, most of the rooms that I present in are either all white or all black, <laughs> this book. And it's a very different conversation 
when I am talking to white people about these issues, and many of these white people that are coming to my talks are people who are actually interested in seeing me and you as human beings uh, and are trying to figure out a way to do away with the racist ideas that they've been taught their whole lives for them to not see us as human beings. And so, you know, that gives me hope. But then it also gives me hope that black people are becoming more and more open-minded to these ideas too. So they don't see black poor people, but they see poor people. They don't see black elites as a problem, they see maybe elites as a problem, right? You see the sort of where I'm, I'm, I'm going with this, and you know, that's really what we, what we, yes. I wanted to ask, how could we as a, a university, a mm -hmm. system, mm -hmm. how could we as a university help black people in the are ideas and merely that, simply theories and not truths about what we have been told and been likely believed about blacks. So I, I think that first and foremost, the idea that people had, and I said many times at FAMU, that there's something wrong with Albany State or there's something wrong with HBCUs, like if we could have a really serious discussion uh, about that, to recognize that that's simply not true and it's based on racist ideas. But then I think one of the difficulties of a university is you have professors and their classes are their domains, you know, so they have the right and power and control to teach what they want to teach. And at Albany State, just like at FAMU, just like at UF, you have professors who regularly teach racist ideas, who look like you and I. And so how do we get these people to stop teaching those things. Just like you have professors who don't, who teach anti-racist ideas. Um, and you have professors who do both. And one of the things about my book is you see individuals who express both racist and anti-racist ideas. And so people can say, you know what, black men are equal to white women, to white men, but black women are uglier than white men, than white women. So one is an anti-racist idea, the other is a racist idea. And so, you know, it's a very, very complex sort of thing. But I would say, you know, begin at least with this conversation about the fact that there is nothing wrong with HBCUs. And studies show that people who graduate, black people who graduate from HBCU, do better in their career than black people who graduate from historically white colleges and universities. First, Secondly, I mean, you know, I can go down the list that all of these ideas are simply not true. They're just not true, right? And we, should, we shouldn't be comparing Albany State and what it does and does not do and what it has and does not have to UGA or to Georgia Tech or to Emory, right? We need to, if we're going to make a comparison with Albany State, it should be another college or university in the state that has a similar economic profile. That's what, but those are the institutions that typically black students don't go to. Black students typically go to these elite in white institutions or HBCUs. So their conception typically is these two institutions and they compare. It's a false comparison to compare FAMU to UF. I mean, it's, 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 it's a false comparison. It's better to compare FAMU to the University of North Florida, to give an example. Right? And so I think, you know, really starting with that, with that conversation. I think we're supposed to be over. Oh, yeah. <laughs> And I did want to say, as a National Book Award winner, you could go anywhere you want to and discuss your book. And I wanted to thank you for committing to HBCUs. You didn't have to come to Albany State, but you.